Hello and a very good evening to everybody assembled here. If our timepieces are all in synchrony, then they will all be showing that it's slightly after 6 p.m. today, which is the 21st of April, 2023, and the day and time put together means that the occasion is something that is very close to the hearts of all of us assembled here. It's the time for the third Shonali Chakraborty Memorial Lecture, to which, on behalf of the Shonali Chakraborty Foundation, it is my great privilege to welcome all of you assembled here today, particularly our beloved and respected dignitaries on stage, Professor Bimal Royser, who is also one of us, and our speaker today, Sri Johor Sharkar. Also, a very big welcome to all dignitaries in the audience, and of course, to all other members of the audience. Before we progress, um, an earnest request, if you would please put your phones onto a mode that will ensure that they don't disrupt or interfere with the proceedings, it will be very helpful. Before everything else, for the benefit of those of you who may not be aware, and also because it is a very uh, befitting introduction to the proceedings, um, a few words about the foundation, the Shonali Chakraborty Foundation, and the event. The Shonali Chakraborty Foundation is a government-registered public charitable trust which aims to extend and perpetuate the benevolence that Shonali Chakraborty epitomized in her lifetime. To put things into perspective, Shonali, apart from holding office of the additional excise commissioner, Government of West Bengal, was particularly known in her fraternity for her generosity. Shonali had served the government of West Bengal as a WBCS Group A officer for 25 years, cut short by the only eventuality of mankind. Being amongst the youngest of the batch of 1992, she was one of the very few female officers in the ranks. She always took immense pride in the integrity and righteousness of effectuating her duties, while being draped in a sari every single day she attended office. Apart from her compassion towards associates and the people around her, she is still remembered by her colleagues for her remarkable emphasis on very high moral standards and humanity above everything, even at the cost of personal sacrifice at times, all with an indelible smile on her face. To commemorate her indomitable spirit, the Foundation wishes to undertake projects which can change the quality of life of the beneficiaries with a focus on the underprivileged women. <clears throat> the endeavors will have the priority of efforts in the augmentation of infrastructure in the educational sector. To briefly touch upon some of the programs that the Foundation is actively working on, keeping in mind the priority of efforts in the educational sector, especially for the underprivileged, an infrastructure has been set up at a primary school in remote South 24 Parganas at Ram Rampur Junior Basic School for disseminating computer literacy among children attending school there. The foundation, in collaboration with Women's Christian College, the college from which Shonali graduated with honors in English, has started a civil service study center which provides assistance to aspiring candidates for different competitive examinations for public service, especially to those who are not privileged enough to afford it. Direct training, study materials, regular assessment and mock tests will be part of this program. Senior WBCS officials have been kind enough to voluntarily participate and help in this endeavor. This annual lecture series on public administration is organized by the Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture from the endowment institute by, instituted by the foundation to usher in a new thought process for those in the service of the public. 
which Shonali imbibed to the best of her efforts in a dignified manner. The inaugural lecture was delivered by Shami Attupriyanando, the secretary and pro-chancellor Ramakrishna Mission Bibekanando University, Belur Mot, on the topic Humanistic Ethics and Public Administration. The second lecture was delivered by Onita Ognihotri, a former civil servant and noted writer on the topic Women and Administration. The lectures are later published in print by the Foundation. Having given you an introduction to uh, what you might expect today, I would like to inform you that the second of the lectures, the one that was delivered last year, has been put together uh, in print by the Foundation and uh, before today's lecture, we would like to publicly uh, release the printed proceedings. And uh, to that end, I would like to invite our dignitaries on the stage to um, help with the release of the book. But I would also like to invite um, Professor Dr. Ajahn Tapal, Principal of Women's Christian College, and uh, Shami Eko Chittanondo, Principal of Ramakrishna Mission Residential College, Narendrapur, to come on stage and um, help with the public release of the last set of printed lectures. Sir, Madam, please. Please give them a big hand. The four envelopes on the table each contain a copy, so if you would please open them together and uh, display them. Ladies and gentlemen, the printed version of last year's lecture. Thank you very much, sir, ma'am. And now, um, I'd just like to say a few words about Professor Bimal Roy, and the reason will be clear soon enough. He's a co-founder of the Shonali Chakraborty Foundation a renowned cryptologist and a professor in ISI Kolkata. He was formerly the chair of the National Statistics Commission and the director of ICI and is a Padma awardee. I would like to ask Professor Bimal Roy to please come up and introduce our speaker for today and then invite him to deliver today's lecture, sir. It's my pleasure to introduce a towering personality like Johar Da or Mr. Johar Sharkar. He is currently a Rajya Sabha MP from the state of West Bengal. And he's also a member of very many important parliamentary bodies like the Joint Consultative Committee on Biodiversity Amendment Bill, the Standing Committee on Communications and Information Technology, and the Consultative Committee of the Ministry of MSME. He was an IAS officer for a very long stint of time, 41 years, 1975 to 2016. And he rose to the rank of Secretary to the Government of India. He headed the Cultural Ministry from 2008-2012. He was then appointed as the CEO of India's public broadcaster for five years, 12 to 17. But he quit a few months prematurely. He knows the reason for it. I don't. Okay. He has been active in research even while working full-time in administration and his first work on the construction of the Hindu identity in medieval Western, West Bengal 
the role of popular cults was well received in India and abroad. He has published numerous articles and research papers on cultural, historical, and anthropological subjects for several years. He has been commended for his recent book in Bangla, Taraparvoner Iti Kotha, on religious festivals of India and their socio-economic role and significance. In 2017, Mr. Shorkar was elected as the first non-academic chairman of the prestigious Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. And we, of course, are looking forward to his talk. Mr. Shorkar, please. Good evening, everyone. This is the record attendance going with the temperature. I thought I would come to an empty hall. Uh, thank you for taking the trouble to come. Uh, respected Swamiji's, respected Professor Roy, respected seniors, anybody above 71 gets my respect, and everybody else. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak from this podium of from Christian Mission, and I remember fondly my association with it. <clears throat> it is also my honor to speak on uh, speak at the Shonali Chakravarti Foundation lecture series. Find Anita has also spoken. Now, today the subject that I'll speak on is public administration in changing times. I have purposely chosen this subject because public administration is a slippery subject, a not much liked subject. Uh, it is a bit like spouses. You can't do without them, you can do a with them. I mean, either way, public administration and citizens have this spouse type relation that however much you may disagree, you can't get rid of them either. The point is, uh, the foundation of human society rests on one organization that got them together. I'm not talking of one homogeneous human society, I'm talking of a million human societies all over the globe from the post-Paleolithic period till today. And this organization that has held humans together by like, by dislike, by fear, and occasionally by patriotism and love is an organization known as the state. The state, what distinguishes the state from all other organizations anywhere is three rights. If nothing else, the state has three rights that no one else has. And these rights have been conferred on the state literally tens of thousands of years ago. To tell you frankly, uh, modern humans as we recognize ourselves evolved only around 10,000 years ago after the last glacial warming. What we call the, the Anthropocene age, just about 11,000 to 10,000, and the formation of the modern state can be traced right from the beginning. In any case, what are these three rights that no other society has, not even I'm Christian Mission, not even any foundation, these are the right to tax. No one else has the right to tax. They can raise collections, they can raise donations, they can raise extortions, tolabaji, but they can't raise taxes legitimately passed. The second right is a right to requisition. The state is the only organization that can say that I am requisitioning your property, the CRPF will be camping here. You may like it, you may not like it, but that power rests with the state. And the third 
is even more dangerous, and that is the inherent right to kill. The right to kill lies with the state, but following a particular normative structure, what we call the rule of law, not like what we saw a few days ago in a particular state. Even a gangster deserves a fair trial under the rule of law. So the state has the right to kill under the rule of law within the, its boundaries and to kill beyond its boundaries in order to save itself. That's all. If we take these hardcore functions of the state, we are left with what we call communicative and welfare functions. These three are hardcore functions of the state. There's no point in discussing them. Uh, the rest of the functions are supposed to be either regulatory or oriented towards some amount of service. Now, public administration is, as you know, taught in many colleges, universities. I also studied public administration. But three years later, when I got into public administration, I found that had nothing to do with what I had studied. So the first thing they tell you in the IAS training college is just forget whatever you have learned. You have to spend some time unlearning everything. Unlearning everything. No, so there is this explanation that you and I have all read, that there is a state structure, there is legislative, there is judiciary, there is the executive, that these are layers. Here we start with the Panchayat Samiti and we go up to the top to parliament, and this is how it operates. That is a highly structural explanation. It is like saying this is a car, these are the wheels, this is the bonnet, this is the dicky, this is a steering wheel, and this is how it looks like. For someone who has not seen a car, of course, such people don't exist, he would be astounded with that explanation that this one has four wheels, it moves on four wheels. That's a very structural exp exp uh, explanation. The other more realistic explanation would be what I call the historic explanation. Now, public administration with its accompanying services, the public services, together known <coughs> as a bureaucracy, you see, the difference between the bureaucracy and the civil service is something that civil servants are told to be very careful about from year one. The rest of the world can call us bureaucrats, but we call ourselves civil servants. But today I heard the speech of the Prime Minister on Civil Service Day, where he hardly ever used the word civil service. He said, you bureaucrats, you bureaucrats, you bureaucrats. So in a way, he was being realistic. What the public think is what is the real story. But in the history of the world and empires, kingdoms and chiefdoms, there, have been, there has been an essential binding factor, the quick fix of the state, which has been the civil services. These civil services have been necessarily there to bind and carry forward the duties of the state, they have almost all the time been quite oppressive, quite oppressive, and that is something that happens by nature. You put up a mango crate in the middle of a traffic infested road, and somebody gets up on the mango crate, he automatically acquires a lot of power. Or if you see, if you go along the crowds, you will suddenly find an odd man standing with a stick holding everybody to order. Authority confers upon itself certain natures, certain feelings, which may be nauseating, but come along with it. Just like when somebody goes out to fight, he cannot say that, let me take my pen and keep it. When he fights, he has to develop a belligerent mood, or otherwise he can't fight. He has to develop a mood for warfare. Anyway, the, in India, there is a long tradition, and the first proper text that we find is Chanakya's Arthashastra, which lays down in great detail 
from the ticket counter up to the uh, last detail. It lays down in great detail. I have my doubts whether such a system could ever work. It looks too theoretical. I think Chanakya was a professor at the end of it who wrote about public administration and we retrospectively give him, give him uh, the, uh, what shall I say, the pass to have run it because it's too theoretical. Whatever it is, we have a structure and whether it reflects the Maurya empire or whether it does not reflect fully the structure, the functions of the Maurya empire, we are not sure. But what we are certain is that the Mauryas held the biggest empire known in ancient India together. Together. And this togetherness was through communications, through administration, through its armed forces, through its police forces, through its uh, postal system, through its revenue collection, through its water wells at different parts to supply water to some amount of roads. It went through the whole works. We find that this next major administration of the Guptas, the Cholas, who had magnificent administrative structures. These magnificent administrative structures actually meant that they were efficient enough to acquire revenue. And there's a direct connection between extraction of revenue and display of pomp. Whenever I see a great architectural marvel, I look upon it as an accountant. How much would it have cost? Whether it be the statue, gigantic statue of Sadar Patel or anyone. How much would it, I don't get into whether it was required. Whether Mamtaz Mahal required just a tomb or did she require such a grand edifice like the Taj Mahal? That's not my business. My business is how much did it cost? Secondly, where did the cost come from? The cost for such huge palaces and buildings can come only by taxes, by extortion, and by exploitation. So let us not fool ourselves when we see huge imarats that they were acts of glory. They were. They were also acts of vanity. And they have left behind a precious heritage, a magnificent heritage, but behind it is a question of how, the, how, how, how efficiently the state was run. So the Chinese had actually perfected their system of running public services and public administration right from day one. The Chinese bureaucracy never smiled. Most bureaucrats don't smile anyway. If you look at them with a problem, they look back at you as if worried that the whole world is going to collapse. Haha, balloon, balloon. Oh. So that sort of thing, the Chinese bureaucracy was also very famous. In India, one of the reasons why the sultans managed to come in, defeat various pro pro other principalities, and rule for about 300 to 350 years uninterrupted, except their own succession battles, was they had a super efficient bureaucracy, public administration system, no doubt about it. We are not getting into the moral question of whether this was good or this was bad. We are simply saying a fact. Similarly, the Mughals, the administration of the Mughals, I can say without fear of contradiction, was the finest that India had seen. And the operations were so smooth that, and the acquisition of state capital, the state corpus was done so smoothly that you had all the magnificent buildings coming up in Indian history, almost all of them coming up during the Mughal period. In any case, this was followed by a state of deterioration, a state of rottenness, when in the late Mughal period, that is after Aurangzeb, the rot started. Corruption reached all-time highs, and this is when the British moved in. The tragic part is, I've written elsewhere, 
The tragic part is that the British selected this rotten post mogul bureaucracy as a role model. As a role model. This was inflicted upon India, saying that, why did they select? For the simple reason that they had no civil service of their own. The British civil service was copied, copied the civil service of the colonies. So everybody was experimenting. They in the Western world was experimenting when rotten or otherwise systems existed. Now that was a historical explanation. I'll get into what I call the functional explanation. And functionally, I have divided the three, defense, armed forces, that is both army and police, law and order, and others into one hard course, hard area of the state, and separated the public services out of it. They consist of roads and maintenance of roads, including corruption thereof, water, supply of drinking water, supply of irrigation water, health facilities, uh, food, management of food and public distribution, urban regulations, power supply, and the whole works, this one. This is what we call the core administration, and our focus will be to see <coughs> whether it is in a position to manage the manage in the changing times. Uh, what, when we look at changing times, I often look at myself because I happen to span about 50 years in this business, almost. In 1977, at around 24, I was appointed as SDO Barashat. And my friends in Kolkata wanted to know where was Barashat. That was the level of, you know, <coughs> level of uh, knowledge that existed even in presidency college. So, Barashat to kota hai. And I'm chanting to kacha kachi kota hai. So, <coughs> they, they hardly knew where it was. And I hope you're taking some lanterns with you. I said there are enough lanterns there. Mm. Then take biscuits and tooth. But this was all well meaning suggestions because they thought, and Barasat, as you know, is just north of, just as you move along the VIP road, it's all Barasat. Rajarhat is the beginning point of Barasat. But anyway, that Barasat where I stepped into Hastings bungalow, and I could actually hear the whispers of senior staff saying, so I was ushered into the room had a population of eight or nine lakhs. It had seven police stations and seven blocks. Today's Barasat has around 30 lakhs. It has 14 police stations, including Newtown, but seven blocks. There has been an exponential increase in the population of all our habitat areas. So when we talk of India has beaten China in population. We take it as some sort of an achievement. I find it very mysterious. It has happened. Happened for no fault of ours, actually. But anyway, this explosion in the, in the services that have to be offered to the public leads to a lot of problems. Lot of problems. Uh, what was a police station in my time? I was surprised to go visit my first police station called Degonga, which was with one brick house, small brick house in the beginning. And after that, all of them, what we call Tinechal. And the last end was a thatched roof. So I went in and found that the total police station area that had at least 100 villages to look after, had a magnificent force of one senior sub-inspector. Six sub-inspectors out of two were perennially ill or had taken leave for their daughter's higher secondary or secondary exam. Uh, 
four, five assistant sub inspectors and award promoter at constables award, seven or ten of them. Two or three of them were always in Bihar. So this was the condition. And any time a law and order broke out, the maximum force we could get out was in one rotten jeep, which used to make more sound than any artillery. And they would get on top and uh, hold some bayonets and uh, reach the spot. That's it. But how did they run the state? I didn't want to get into the core areas, but this is interesting. How did they run it? They ran it, ran it on the British principle of fear, awe, regard. Police chagalo, police chagalo, pala, pala, pala. These are sentences we have heard. And what this police is and what their strength is, nobody wants to go to end to count. So most of the situations were managed. So this was the type. And now, of course, things are completely different. The population has gone up. The scale of services has gone up intensely. People talk about the good old days of the ICS. I have relations who were in the ICS. And they asked me one question. What are you doing in office till 8 o'clock? I said, working. He said, we came out at 4 o'clock for tennis. I said, that's because you were the Indian Civil Service. You were the Imperial Service. We are not. We have to work. Of course, not that everyone works, but the foolish ones do. So we have the scale of urbanization. The scale of the penetration of the state has increased then government's area has become bigger and more than this. Expectations of the people are much different from what it was 45 years ago. Uh, they used to, their favorite sport was to Gherau police stations. And I remember that uh, all the seven police stations I had visited, five of which I visited for the first time because it was under Gherau. We have to go and negotiate and all that. I am afraid that uh, my parents did not give much confidence to them. So they said, DM Gachai. And finally they settled on me and uh, they were not satisfied, but chalo, at least SDU has come. So they went on. Mm. I'll now deal with the expectations and the possible deliveries, the possible stratagems in changing times, through four examples. One is correspondence, communication with citizens. This has always been the weakest link in government. The weakest link because the imperial forces, when they set up, they operated on the principles of the rotten post mogul state. I have empirical proof on it, I have published articles on it. But anyway, the point is, it was a top-down approach. And the genes of the top-down approach still exist. The top-down approach was there, and uh, there was something called the Imperial Secretariat Service, uh, to which I was introduced when I joined Delhi in 1985. And uh, here was this tribe of people, mainly from North India, who populated the Imperial Secretariat Service. God bless them, they had come in for service, but the way I felt, I asked them questions. How much had they seen outside Delhi, outside the beat of the center of Delhi, known as Luton's Delhi, where I seen a hill? Most of them hadn't. And they were governing Kanyakumari. They were governing Kohima, sitting there. So you understand the myopic, the point of the vision, the difference of the vision. Many of the orders that came out from the Home Ministry during Corona made me laugh for the same reason. 30 years, 45 years later, the same mentality persists. And the style of the letters was that I am directed, you are directed to appear, etc., etc. Of course, you are directed to appear. Nowadays, means you are directed to appear before the CBI or ED. But in any case, even if you have put in an application, 
for a pipeline in the corporation, they'll say you are directed to appear for a hearing. If you have anything, you are directed to appear. It's always directed to appear. Now, this sort of thing happened uh, a lot, and it happens even now. And part of it is because of the mentality and because of the rules. Let me give you an example. One day, Dr. Karan Singh, who was part of our Ministry of Culture, he approached me and said, Yar Jawar, uh, I'll speak in Hindi. Yar Jawar, Tvari ministry to kafi uh, problematic hai. I said, Kya hua, sir? Bolo, main tumko likhta hu. He used to call me Tum, because he's about, still now about 20 years older than me, more than that. He was a minister when I was in school, union minister. He said, I have to write a letter, I have to write a letter, I have to write a I called for the files. Yes, I found that whatever letter he had written to me, I had practically dictated what is to be written on the body of the letter, so, so that it doesn't come down and go up and the ultimate 15 days later, you may like to see a letter from Dr. Karan Singh, what reply do we give? I have to write the reply or whatever on the body of the letter. That file would still go up and go down and take my final approval. I said, yeah, I have already written. But they said, we need it in the green pages. Oh, so I put a signature on the green side of the pages, the note sheet as they call it. I let the file down. After that, I made a mistake. I never checked what happened to it because these letters come in hundreds. This would go down to an undersecretary or section officer who would reply to Dr. Karan Singh, saying that Dr. Karan Singh, I'm directed to say that you are directed to do and that sort of a letter which you would put him off. The old man would necessarily get angry. <laughs> he said, I've written to the secretary, who is this fellow replying? Who is this fellow replying in between? Whatever it is, so uh, well, these are systems. The challenge or the, or the major difference that has taken place is in the last 10 to 15 years. 15 years is what I would put it. When we started, we decided in the service IAS and others, we decided that we'll correspond only on emails. The first correspondence of emails was taken as illicit. Aboidho. Well, sir, it's not provided in the records manual. I said, to hell with your records manual. I'm writing to you instead of writing and putting it directly to you in mail. Dear Chauhan, uh, kindly dispose of this. So Chauhan would take a copy of the email, make a hard copy of it and say, Yaha sign kije. I said, what is that? It's authentic manani hai. So they, it was clear that all of them were still living in the 19th century. And then I issued a direction saying that email is equal to authentication. To which they had a lot of murmurs, ye kahan se aage? So, and many of the officers said, Mujhe ko mail ni mili. I said, have we checked your mail, Bakha? So they had a beautiful system in their email. Whatever mail they didn't understand would get into spam. You know, the spam box, so I, they opened the spam box and all my letters came off. So it's been a terrible, terrible, a terrific journey of how to get emails done. And I had a revolt from a director general of the news division saying, I will not reply on email. My reply was again on email saying, you jolly well will reply. So it goes on like that. One good thing of the email is that a record is, automatic record is kept, electronic database. B, you cannot obliterate it. C, it is better than the file because file hariye gache, file milne rahi is a perennial thing you hear everywhere. But here if the email tells you what you have done, what you have directed, what you have received, what you have said, it's there on permanent record. So when some mischievous elements went off, went after me, my record was, I had the emails of all the correspondents. So this is one thing, email is just a minor way of putting it, but this is one thing where the moment you get a letter, more nowadays most people would prefer to send an email if possible. Even if they write a letter, they scan it and send it. You can reply on this spot. There is no point in sending the reply down and all that. 
This arises from the old concept, as I told you, that rotten state of the post mughal When the first administration started, they had one office called the English office. Are you familiar with it? It's, uh, it's available in every district of India. If you go there and ask for the English office, they'll look at you and say that you know administration, what a great thing. What is this English office? It means that native uh, leaders and rajas and zamindars would write in fluent Bangla or Urdu or whatever. It would go to the English office where it would be transcribed into English for which we had a system called Reader Babu. And this term reader was also taken into education, but never mind. Uh, it's gone now. It's become assistant professor, or associate professor. So, Reader Babu exists in the administration. Even now, you go to Alipur court, you go to any court, you'll find the Reader Babu. So, one letter would come, and the Reader Babu would try to find the Sahib between two tennis matches, and he would read out that one letter. The Sahib would say, you get this done this way, then again it would go down, it would be authenticated and all that. The volume was so little. People would not correspond with the imperial government. And here the volume has come up in such large numbers. When I was sitting there, I found a letter from a girl saying that she wants to visit parliament in uh, the parliament building. So they'll write. The next area where I'll touch for explaining the uh, changes that have taken place is digitalization or digitization of services. This has happened at a maddening pace. I am using the word maddening pace because I remember in 1994, we had got the first set of computers in finance department in Bengal government and installed them in our pay and accounts office. We couldn't install them. They were there in the trucks and there was agitation saying we will not allow computers to come in. I went and tried to explain, said no way can we allow. I said okay. So the computers were taken somewhere. And then we got a huge agitation coming up and saying that our pay bill, I, we must get a copy of the pay record. Now pay bills were all written by hand. Repetitive. Every month I'll get the same pay. My pay doesn't go up, no, excepting once a year. So basic doesn't go up, DA doesn't go up. So it's repetitive work. And you go to writer's building, they say that finance, they are busy writing pay bills throughout the month. Another primitive system was that everybody wanted their money in cash. We tried introducing the check system, it didn't work. So <clears throat> how did this operation run? It's very interesting. Uh, at midnight, approximately, I won't give you the dates in case somebody gets adventurous, uh, the traffic would be stopped between Writers and Reserve Bank. Get on midnight. The police of Calcutta would stop the roads on both sides with guns. And then trunks, will, trunks of cash will come from Reserve Bank to the locker of writer's building downstairs. Can you imagine? And then they would be made into rubber band garters and then sent. So mercifully, these systems have been eliminated. And I remember one of the small interesting victories, if one may put it, the employees said, that, no, no, we are not going to allow. Pay bills have to be written by hand. I said, why? He said, the machine will make fault. I said, the hands, the hands make more fault than machines. He said, it's very difficult to argue with you. I said, yes, with you the same. So it went on like that. But they wanted pay slips. I said, why do you want a pay slip? Because I want to keep it for my pension. Excellent. So what we did was, the entire pay bill was made over to a pay slip computer section. Okay? And his entire pay details were put in and fed into the computer program. 
So while the hand pay bills were being made, we could generate what you call mirror image slips, absolute mirror image slips. And sometimes we pointed out mistakes to the handwriting pay division. When the weather changed, political weather changed a bit, and I remember the chief minister said, I immediately pounced on that opportunity and started. He said, Kobocho Lagbe, I said, Sir, Tindin Lagbe. He looked at me and said, Tindin? I said, Tindin. He didn't know that we had all the machine, all the duplicate records on what we call the pay slip section. So all we did was a pay slip section was made into pay bill section, that's all. So this is how you have to keep parallel track, parallel track on computer to be at a stage when computers were not allowed. I'm talking of that stage of 94, 95 and all that. Things are completely different. And here, now look at the administration of digitization, how it has helped the other sector, railways. Remember the proverbial corruption? The amount of charges you have to give for a ticket, and a ticket would come, such a small ticket would come that nobody could read, uh, like a bit of mud or clay, that color, and that was all. Then, we then computerization was introduced in all counters of the railways. But if you sent a chap, at 6 o'clock, 6.30, he said, sir, I was number four in the line. I said, then what happened? By the time I went there, I found all their seats had been taken. So that means they had got into the computer racket also. Finally, the rackets could be broken, and now the things have smoothened up. With Tatkal and all that, things have smoothened up. Corruption can never go. It can take new forms. That's all. Like, like virus, it can mutate into different ways. So railways is there. Airlines, I don't know how many of you remember the number of days we spent in Chitranya and Avila office just to get a ticket, airlines ticket, Air India ticket. Those days have gone. Then even KMC has become quite progressive. As compared to that, I find NDMC, New Delhi Municipal Corporation, where I stay in Delhi, completely computerized. Payments. Payments prove to be quite a problem and still continue to be quite a problem. And even digital banking is often full of, full of clutter, obstructions. But then other systems have come in, what we call digital payments, Google Pay, Paytm, and others, where people who are acquainted with it and people who have faith in the system, I have never been tricked. You can go on making all the payments. So administration is not the monopoly of one set. It is a distributed work between different departments. What we learn from each other is the execution of a particular principle in a particular way. One good example, I was in the Ministry of Commerce in 1986-87, and we found that commerce had put in a lot of computers, 85-86, and Bengal problem was in 95-94-95. Anyway, so 85-86, <coughs> we had a lot of computers that whatever things were exported, the documents, were computerized. And across the barrier, once the bill of lading is crossed, it crosses the barrier, it gets into export zone. The port is supposed to be an export zone. It is a secluded zone by customs. The moment it gets there, they have a customs bill. Fair enough. When we tried to tally it after three months of running both systems, we found the systems had not married. They couldn't understand each other. This language of this computer and that language of that computer did not understand each other. So these problems have happened, but we have managed to the extent that, as you see, today, do you know that many of you, or most of you, pay taxes? Even if you don't pay taxes, you must be sending your returns. That 95% of India's tax returns are dealt with only by machines. 95%. Sometimes even more. So 3% to 5% of the tax returns would go up for what we call the manual check. 
what can be done by a machine is best done by a machine. If you can get powdered spices, why do you sit in the kitchen and start grinding spices all the time? You save time, that's all. Save time. So there was this fear of job replacement. I have lived a whole lifetime, straight from the way computers were being introduced till now. I have found jobs only increasing. What happened in a one type of redundant work has been got off. One type of redundant work has been got rid of. And something more engaging has been created. That's all. That's all. And this will happen. They say AI. You must have heard the term AI. Artificial intelligence. This is causing rocking waves all over. Where artificial intelligence means you don't need to understand the prompt and you don't need to understand. They'll go in for their own solutions provided the data is fed in. They say, deadly. Deadly, he's getting into my correspondence. I said, hang on. Do you type into a computer? Do you type into the mobile? He said, what? Yes. Do you see a word coming as prompt? If you type the word, going, immediately a word will come to you from, to. It will be either from or to. I mean, you don't need artificial intelligence. You need some common sense. So these prompts are coming, and that is a rudimentary form of a... Artificial intelligence. The word prompts that come to you to facilitate. I have full faith in this, that, but I'll come to another area where, where uh, computerization has really come in. Otherwise, digitization, the modern handling of public administration, had it not been there, we'd not be able to manage the numbers. I don't know about quality, but I know the management of numbers is frightening. And I'm talking about health coverage. Health coverage is done in this state under Shastra Sati, Shastra Sati, where up to a family can be covered up to 5 lakhs in a year. Most of the people know it. And 2.5 crore people have already been covered. It's also handled parallelly in Government of India, All India, so called Ayushman Bharat, Bharat, NHP mission, same principles. I have served both governments, so I have to know what's happening. It's the same principles, they have done four and a half crores. So in that way, four and a half crores for the whole of India and Bengal has done two and a half crores for the state. I think they have, Bengal has done better that way. Whatever be it, and we have statistics. The point is, for Shastashathi and this thing, and also the data you give at hospitals and the data you give for health insurance, they are all computerized. So if somebody wants a medical picture and they are all linked to Aadhaar, your Aadhaar number is now compulsory, a medical profile of you can be made far more efficiently than you can make. Because if I ask you, you'll go back and open the prescriptions one after the other, one after the other. That's the way we operate. We are humans. And here, the things that were kept on computer, mercifully, they are not integrated. But the point is, what if they are integrated? Now, what if they are integrated leads to the next question. Can the data be put to better use? Can we have an intelligence-based operational system which gets to your health data as a permanent thing? So what? If I have stomach problems, if I have ulcer, I have ulcer. So what? Whether it can get to and help in telelinking, telemedicine. You know, telemedicine is becoming more and more. How long can you go and wait outside a doctor? Basically, he will look at some of the questions, look at some of the inputs and give you a reply. This will be one job that will be taken over by AI. Five years. Five years. That will be taken over by AI. There will be initial resistance. Why should I tell you what I have? Those resistance will be half cut down because you have already given your details for either Ayushman Bhavat or Swastatati or for life insurance or for medical claim and all that. The database is already there. Now the question is what happens if this data is dealt with dangerously? 
why at the on the IT standing committee in Parliament, the question that I asked the departments of IT, telecommunication, the Aadhaar, we asked them one question, that you want a complete integration. I have my principal questions on it. But you are getting to on at a speed faster than me because you have the edge of state power with you. Fair enough. What you are doing is going in for one integrated system where everything is connected to everything. If tomorrow there is an evil force that decides to make me a non-person, switches me off, what happens then? I go to my bank, they said, no, you can't operate. I go to my net banking, they say, no, you're blocked out. I go to an ATM, they say, you're blocked out. I go to a railway station, they say, a railway booking, you're blocked out. An airline booking, you're blocked out. Any facility, you're blocked out. So there's an inherent danger in the whole process of integration of data that somebody, if it is like one of those mysterious science fiction, Dr. No type, creature, a Mogambo type creature, if they sit there and switch the button, they can make you a non-person. You don't exist. You don't exist. Your Radha says you died yesterday. Finished. So this possibility remains about which we need to be very careful. But as I said, human society is a struggle between transparency and control. Transparency and control. This is the essence of human life. Hmm. So, add approvals. So when a wife asks, how is my sari? She's not asking whether the color is good. She's saying it must, it is good because she has chosen it. Her choice is very good because she chose you also. Anyway, so we go on and this sort of system will actually go on increasing. The last point I'll touch upon is dig digital education. Education in the world of contemporary digital technologies, COVID shows our, showed us how backward we are. When COVID came in and we were all confined, people who have some interaction with little kids would understand how difficult they had, difficulty they had. I have about three to four of these youngsters, uh, one of the drivers, sons and daughters, who'd come to me and say, please uh, help me with your smartphone, because everything was coming on a smartphone. I said, I'm not giving you a smartphone. Ask my wife. She's more at home. Because all these questions will come when I'm in Delhi. So that way they found that everything was possible on smartphone. Now, you know, India has 80 crore smartphone for 140 crore people. Leave the old ones, absolutely old ones, who may not require it. Another 20 crore, and you have covered the gap between 10 years and 70 years, entire lot. So many people think the mobile is a nuisance, and I have to keep hearing it. For some reason or other, the gut feeling that I have is that it is not a nuisance. When many states have given free mobile smartphones all over, and they say that the children get addicted to it. Of course they get addicted to it. They get, the children will get addicted to everything. They'll get addicted to playing cricket in the hot sun at 43 degrees. They'll get addicted. That, that's why they have children. So a little bit of excess is not bad. I belong to the lost generation. 69 to 74. The heart of the Naxalite problem in Presidency College and Calcutta University, where life was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That was life. We never knew whether to come back home. There were no classes held. It doesn't matter. The human society has its own way of... Our libraries were excellent. Some teachers would hold special classes in their homes. We managed. Everyone will manage. So there's no point in taking on a new contraption and saying this is good, this is bad. We are being judgmental. I have a feeling because I feel that the next revolution will come through the smartphone, the, the perennial access, the smartphone. 
they say it's not moral it's entertainment let it be you want do you know what amount of education this fellow receives when a fellow who is in a village when he sees an american what do they call ki show reality show they beat it exposure that he gets don't cast my value judgment on it the 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 contours of the modern world are all laid out through these audio visuals and they make a greater impact on him so look at the plus points and you will see that our courses forever we have been trying on courses on computer on television on 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 uh, specialized uh, reserved education channels ekalabo uh, we have tried everything by juice beat everybody to the game you heard of by juice by juice beat everybody to the game so it's a question of not preparing the food it's a question of how to show the prepared food that's all every narrative has to have in this age every narrative has to be illustrated at every level the difference between comic and literature has gone there is already something in ms ma literature that's taught everywhere called the digital novel the difference the illustrations the animations the video clips inserted it is a narrative has to be punched with it by just making it so he's holding his audience people are paying fantastic sums middle class people so that their children are one step ahead and the one step ahead is what matters we are in a digital divide now most of it most of this entire transfer of what shall i say the solid part of education to the digital has to be state funded not state guided i am terrified of the state guiding i have spent 41 years with the state and i know how the minds operate i am terrified of the state guiding state has to give it to funding give the funding and leave it to professionals leave it to professionals even though the temptation is the other way around you see this world of this youngster may be in some sort of a dirty show it doesn't matter let it go proceed ahead he is seeing it much younger than anyone else but they live in the digital world they will live in the digital world a 5 year old kid that i was talking about the driver's son he came over take my mo took my mobile took it in two fingers little fingers and put on to his program i said kaisa kiya le ho gaya na when he was not able to speak properly he could he knew how to operate it now they are going to live in a digital world the public the administration of public affairs must wake up to the fact that they is this is a digitally run world this is not mohenjadaro this is not moguls this is not mauryas we have to appreciate that and that the people are no more in that state of slumber our patience where they will take bullshit and let it pass no one will so as i told you the story of evolution there have been responses that are built in many responses that you don't notice but now that i tell you maybe you'll notice but the state's guiding principles are still impressed by the core values the core values of the right to tax the right to requisition and the right to kill that is the core values of the state whereas the core values should move on to the other world that i talked about roti kapra or bakan that is the whole problem mentalities take a lot of time to change thank you thank you Jawhar Babu's movement away from the podium and back to his seat could be a kind of physical indication that uh, his presentation has ended but I think it's going to be a long time before the ripples from his presentation will have uh, ended making some kind of impression in our minds and so uh, 
to formally respond on behalf of the Shonali Chakraborty Foundation to this wonderful presentation this evening. I'd like once again to call upon Professor Bimal Roy and uh, please make your own comments about uh, today's uh, presentation, sir, and then please uh, formally thank Johar Babu on behalf of the Foundation. On behalf of Shomali Chakraborty Foundation, well, I'm, I'm so thankful to Mr. Sarkar for this outstanding or wonderful, informative, as well as entertaining uh, deliberation of his thoughts on the public administration in this changing world. And, well, it's very difficult even to express my, my uh, I was so mesmerized uh, while I was going through all his statements, so I don't know even how to thank him. Uh, but only one thing came to my mind when I was listening to him, is a short story by Shotojit Rai, which was filmed in English. Anukul. So if Johar Babu has seen that movie, 14 minutes or 15 minutes short movie, then I think Shatuit Roy in 60s could think of this kind of digitization, the role of AI, and how it could possibly um, even affect the human society. Well, he pointed out some negatives, which you also pointed out. and. Uh, I was just listening to something like Shatyatra's Onukul. If you didn't read or see the movie, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, we can download from the YouTube short movie and you'll understand what I mean by uh, this. So thank you again. So you have emulated Onukul for us. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, with that, we come to the end of uh, today's uh, presentation. But as I um, have told you before, I'm sure you will have a lot to take away from um, what we were privileged to hear today. Also, to make sure you don't uh, lose the uh, printed form of the proceedings of our previous two lectures, um, when you leave, do make sure you collect a copy of uh, the booklets that have put together the previous lectures in this series that the Shonali Chakraborty Foundation brings you. So we wish you a very good night, but uh, do uh, make sure you collect a copy, both of uh, the printed lecture released today, and I think we also have copies of the first lecture. Thank you very much. Good night.